to join. We're recording at the moment. Um, so hi and welcome everyone. I am Naimisha Murthy and I'm the founder of Products by Women. Before we do get started, I do want to say a big thank you to you all for being here today and investing in yourself. I also want to say a big thank you to our partners for today, Parley Me. They are not here with us right now because it's very, very early in UK at the moment. But I also want to thank our amazing speakers and Srinidhi is going to do an in-depth uh, introduction. But before we do get started, some general housekeeping rules. This event is being recorded. Uh, we will be sharing a recording on our YouTube channel and via email. So stay tuned for that. Please do feel free to drop any of your questions in the chat box. We will be answering them at the end of the session. And if we don't get to it, please connect with all the amazing speakers on LinkedIn or anywhere else you find them. Um, I will be dropping a networking sheet and some Slack information in just a minute after my introduction. So connect with each other, put all your information there and let's help each other learn more about NFTs and everything else. Our next session is on Saturday and it's about angel investing. Uh, so if you all want to learn a little bit about angel investing and get started on that journey, this is a great event for you to attend. Uh, and then just a couple of more things um, in honor of women's History Month, uh, this week we just launched our women-owned marketplace uh, where we feature women-owned businesses. So do go on to our website and check it out it, on productsbywomen.com. There's some amazing uh, businesses that you can discover there and, and really shop with more intention. Lastly, if you'd like to speak or moderate an upcoming webinar, do reach out to us at products by info at productsbywomen.com. And with that introduction, I will pass it on to Srinidhi, who will be taking it from here and facilitating and moderating this amazing session. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the overview, Naimisha. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome here for this discussion today. We have two speakers, Phil and Isi. So first we have Phil. Phil is a CMO at leprechaun.io. So currently, um, if you see the global gaming industry is around 180, 200 uh, billions worth. And Leprechaun is one of the early birds which invests in the video game industry to adopt global or adopt to blockchain. So over to you, Phil, for uh, some more introduction about yourself. We are so happy to have you here. Hi, no, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And hello, everyone from Hong Kong, where I'm sitting. It's eight o'clock in the morning and I have my coffee. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, uh, 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 Leprechaun is um, a company, it's uh, been tokenized now for since uh, March last year, actually we launched on St. Patrick's Day. Um, uh, Lepre you're absolutely right, uh, the, 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 the nascent industry of blockchain, and it still is nascent um, uh, in, in, in real terms, and the video games industry, which is well established and, and a behemoth, um, we've always felt that video games could and should be one of the really major on-ramps to mass use of blockchain or adoption of blockchain by people. Um, but we also feel that um, building game applications on blockchain, if we go back to the actual blockchain itself, which is simple, irrefutable and immutable proof you own something, um, everything on top of that is the application layer. And whereas we have DeFi, which is um, uh, is one application stack that's come about, we believe that actually you have to go back to square one for games. Um, the way I describe that is this: if every if you had if World of Warcraft was on blockchain, and every time you killed a monster, you had to hit MetaMask saying yes, you can, <laughs> yes, you know, uh, get approval from MetaMask to loot a, a corpse. That is not good for UX. So we have to work out new ways of bringing blockchain into games, this idea of the player-owned economy, but not necessarily in the same way in which pe people experience DeFi, which is very much mm. about uh, sovereignty and identity, whereas gaming is about user experience and, and this shift towards the player-owned economy. So Leprechaun builds uh, its own games. Uh, we have our own gasless sidechain uh, because gas is one of the, the uh, frictions um, to UX. And uh, we've basically been building a series of technologies which will eventually become what we call the blockchain SDK, which is specifically aimed at the mainstream gaming industry and how they can adopt blockchain in a way that's about the game first and not necessarily sort of productizing what blockchain is. Right, yeah. Not bad, <laughs> not bad for one coffee. 
<laughs> no, that was really a great introduction, and I think you also sprayed a couple of uh, terminologies that we would need to go down in deep, oh, like yes. gas fee, DeFi, which we'll probably uh, cover after we introduce the CS well. So most of sure. our audience would be interested in learning those key terms. So now I think uh, Naimisha shared a brief. Uh, uh, point about Women History Month. And if you're someone who's active in Twitter, you could have uh, heard or seen of the hashtag called Making Web3 Her Story. So that was uh, become a buzzword because of the Twitter community called Women in NFTs. And Issy is leading that community called Women in NFTs to bring in more uh, women and non-binary people and educate them in the space. So uh, really nice to have you here, Issy, and we would love to hear uh, some words from you. Thank you. Super excited to be here. Hi, everyone. I'm Isabella or Izzy. Uh, I am one of the co-founders of Women in NFTs. It's a community uh, meant to highlight, connect, and educate women in NFTs, which are non-fungible tokens. We will talk more about those in the discussion. Uh, but essentially, I started this group back in August of last year, just after I started entering the NFT and Web3 space. Uh, and a, a lot of this community is manifesting on Twitter right now. And a lot of the efforts are very <laughs> decentralized, <laughs> um, happening in their own silos. And um, at the time, there really wasn't a place for like to find that community of women, this space is still very heavily male dominated, but there are tons of women in this space already. So really um, women in NFTs is one of the first places people find when they search women in NFTs on Twitter. And it's just such a great launch pad to sort of find community, find more women in the space and just showcasing that we are here. We're doing a lot within the space. And yes, of course we want more, but um, yeah, that's the point of Women in NFTs. It's been really fun. Um, we did start uh, a movement, hopefully, for the rest of the month of uh, hashtag making Web3 history. We think that if you're in this space and participating in any way, you are absolutely part of this historical moment. There's no other time in history where women have been able to be at the table actually in numbers doing things at the beginning of an industry just by way of like society <laughs> like we just haven't really been able to be such an active participant and for marginalized communities in general really um so a lot of those barriers while some still remain many of them are gone and it's just such an exciting time to be a part of this space yeah, 100% agree. And thank you so much for your efforts to bring in more women and non-binary people into the space. Um, yeah, so to give a context of what you're going to discuss to the audience on what you're going to discuss on this call, uh, I think our plan is to understand one, it, what NFTs are, what digital currencies are, how it is relevant to the current world. And in addition to that, uh, we would like to go over from two different perspectives. One, from understanding how the tech piece of it works, and one, how do you actually invest in it and become a part of this evolution right from the start? So that's what you can expect from the session session here with Phil and Issy. And in the introductions, both Phil and Issy talked about a term called decentralized. And DeFi, I think, is a common theme that is associated with both NFTs and digital currencies, right? And before we dive in deep into what NFTs and digital currencies are, uh, for we would like to understand why decentralizing of finance is actually necessary, especially because most of us are used to like online banking, especially with very reliable and uh, security oriented, oriented banking institutions or financial and stock exchanges, which already exist. So why is decentralizing of finance actually needed and how is that relevant to the current times? So if you could just help us or shed some light over that concept, it would be really great to get started with. Izzy, you want to go first? I, I... <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Um, well, actually, uh, it, the, a thought occurred to me um, uh, with your introduction, Izzy, um, when you talked about um, uh, uh, marginal groups, um, you know, uh, outside of... One of the great, I think, one of the great things about decentralized finance, although I am jumping a couple of steps, but I think it's a really important point. Um, 
when you're working when you're working with your um, uh, wallet, which you have your own private keys, I'll jump back on that in a second, and you're interacting with a smart contract, the smart contract can't see you. It doesn't know who you are. It doesn't actually care. And so I think one of the, so we can talk about, uh, you know, whether it be the unbanked uh, around the world, or we can talk about groups, you know, there are plenty of stories in the US about disparate treatment applying for mortgages, for example, depending on certain obvious physical traits. Smart contracts can't see you, and they actually don't care. They only care that you say sign the wallet, and that the funds are in the wallet to execute a transaction. So I think a lot of what we're talking about, and therefore I think a lot of what Izzy, you're looking to uh, set change to, decentralized finance really is a, a very democratic, uh, very libertarian uh, thing in that respect. So I just want to bring that point up. Um, <clears throat> decentralized finance, uh, from my perspective, is just simply, you can look at it many ways. The technical definition is that you have a wallet in assets and you own the private key. And if you have the private key, which is usually it's like 12 word phrase and no one else has a private key, there is no way on earth any human or, or automated entity can access those assets and move them or do anything with them. That's essentially it. Um, blockchain isn't necessarily decentralized. Decentralized is built on top of blockchain because you can have you can own Bitcoin, Ethereum, Matic, whatever, and have it on a central exchange like Binance. The difference is okay. that's a username and password. You don't own the private key, therefore your money can be taken. Um, so decentralized simply means that it's on the blockchain and only the person with the private key to the wallet, that 12 word phrase usually, some are 24 now, um, can make, you can see those funds, you can send money to that wallet address, but you cannot move those funds or take money from that wallet address unless you have the private key. So decentralized simply means there's no middleman, there's no, there's no governing authority um, on, on your assets. And that asset can be a fungible token where, you know, one Matic is the same as another Matic, or it can be a non-fungible token um, where, uh, where one NFT is not the same as another NFT, it's a unique asset. It still sits on the chain and all the blockchain does is say this asset owns, is owned by this wallet address. In mm. fact, when you make a transaction, nothing actually moves. It just changes the record of ownership. It's a ledger. So um, the really important things about decentralized finance, one, we've just touched on the fact that you're not dealing with a human institution like a bank. You're basically right. dealing with a pre-written smart contract, uh, which will simply follow the rules and it does not care who you are. Um, the other thing about this is, of course, that uh, um, when you look at the big shiny office towers here in Hong Kong, I might look at the Bank of China or HSBC. In New York, you might look at JP Morgan or Citibank. Just don't go to JP Morgan in Decentraland. Anyway, you might look at, um, uh, uh, you know, and you go, wow, how do they pay for those huge shiny towers? And the answer is, because most of the money made by banks does not go back to the people who put the funds into the banks to actually make the money. It goes to the yeah. banks. Decentralized finance uh, has, says an organization sets up smart contracts. We can get into things like staking and yield farming and LP tokens and some of the, you know, the, the trickiest stuff later. But at the end of the day, you can take your money, you can put it into what in analogously is a savings account. And because you're not paying for any big shiny offices, you can earn much better returns. Um, and with more skills and more knowledge, you can earn much, much better returns. So, you know, at the end of the day, decentralized finance is one, it gets rid of the people who you take all the most of the profits to pay for big shiny offices. Two, it gives you sovereignty over your assets so that only you control your asset and you control your identity. You don't have, you know, some services may require KYC. That is know your customer. That is your choice. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, uh, it, so, and no one but you can touch your assets. One final thought, in the same, the potential is there, the infrastructure is not. In the same way, in the developing world, mobile um, telecommunications leapfrogged um, fixed line communications, which were the, how uh, most of us used the phone 20 years ago in the West. Um, there is an opportunity for um, blockchain-based finance to leapfrog uh, traditional financial infrastructure in the same way. 
Um, and I think the best chance of providing some sort of financial equality for the unbanked around the world will probably come from this technology. <laughs> More coffee. <laughs> That's definitely uh, a very good uh, introduction about decentralizing finance. And uh, before you share your thoughts, you see, I think uh, I found the point that was very interesting was it is really nice that uh, it eliminates all these disparities in the current society. And something that I was concerned about when Phil talked about this is that uh, there are smart contracts, there are certain rules that are written on how the transactions are going to be made. But there was also a call out saying, uh, maybe my I need not reveal my identity. So in this case of decentralized finance, is it actually safe where if we don't disclose our identity and if you let someone regulate the rules, how does that work? So is there uh, a body that maintains how our transactions happen, how the security is set or uh, how or why does one start us trusting this decentralization process? Um, Phil, is he open to both of you? I can jump in or Phil, I can let you finish your thoughts. No, easy. It's, it. your it's definitely your turn. I've done lots of talking. <laughs> well, you might do a better job of explaining this in terms of like trusting it. There's definitely, I think, a lot of distrust of it in the mainstream. Um, and like Phil said, it's like you're in control of your finances. So there is a level of security uh, measures that you actually just do need to read up on and kind of understand whenever you're coming into this space and investing in cryptocurrencies. So I think that that's something that like, is just a level of research that anyone investing should really like understand and, and know, and there's different security measures that you can take to be more protected. Um, what was the second part of your question? Uh, so is there some regulatory body or something oh. that determines how these rules are set? No, <laughs> I guess it's just the smart contracts. No, that's the point, <laughs> I guess, of decentralized. Like, there's not like a central governing body or a bank or anything like that that's like uh, managing anyone's money. It's just like a network of computers that are mm -hmm. uh, processing uh verifying and logging all of these transactions that are taking place. It's more peer to peer uh, transactions versus going again through that middleman of like, uh, basically like if I pay, try to transfer money to someone here, the security and the downfall is that like, it has to go through a bank. And like Phil said, they take a cut of the money. I'm not, the person at the end is not getting the full amount of money. Um, so of course there's pros and cons, I guess, to the decentralized world. Um, the pro is that like, it is more peer to peer. You control your own money. Uh, you get the full amount. I think the amount of money works harder, right? Because um, sort of the prices of the cryptocurrencies can fluctuate. So like, you know, Bitcoin was like hit an all time blow, what back in 2017 or something. Now people who stayed holding Bitcoin are like millionaires because they held on to their Bitcoin and people who didn't are kicking themselves. Right. So, and in some ways it goes up, uh, up and down as well. It's not just like the static of a dollar and to Phil's point, you know, um, and more, uh, up and coming parts of the world where they're uh, native currency is nothing or, you know, very low, this actually gives them a really great opportunity to, because this is a, a global currency, a Bitcoin here is a Bitcoin in South America is a Bitcoin in uh, Australia, et cetera. So it also gives opportunity in that way. Sorry, I went on a little bit of a tangent from your original question, but. Um, no, no, that was really helpful. Go ahead, Phil. I was just going to throw something in. Um, I think a really important uh, there uh, when it comes to once something is moved off um, into the into into your own wallet where you have your own keys, then you're there. At the moment, there are no there there is no sort of global or very many national regulatory bodies. It's very very difficult to to do anything um, on the centralized world where actually a, most, a, most of the business is because most people start off with central exchanges from Binance to Gate to uh, Coinbase, whatever. Um, uh, those, there is a lot of regulation there. They all have to do KY, you have to KYC. So, uh, uh, you know, and, and there needs to be, 
people do, um, there are bad actors in this space. There are people who take advantage of the fact that um, no one's really regulating um, from bad token raises where there was never really intention to build the product. The industry is rife with that to, to people, to the old traditional stuff like fishing for, for private keys. I'm just going to say here, never give your private key to anyone. It's better to miss an opportunity than ever write, type it in somewhere. Um, and the final point I'll make is decentralized finance has the potential. We've just started. It has serious potential to really change sovereignty in regards to people's money and semblance of their identity. However, it does not shortcut the need for financial literacy. Um, and, um, you know, it doesn't, <laughs> I am active in this space. I um, have been advised, to, I've been involved in multiple token launches. I'm in many communities watching what happens. My heart sinks at the level of financial literacy um, demonstrated. Um, and I think whilst blockchain is the, uh, so blockchain has much to offer a new way in which people can exercise control over important aspects of their life. It has to be combined with the understanding of the very things you're trying to manage. And I still, it doesn't replace that, which I think is very lacking in the world today, particularly the Western world. Right, definitely. Those are really great insights and definitely it sets uh, the groundwork for diving in deep into the NFTs and digital currencies. So thank you so much for uh, helping us understand why uh, decentralizing finance is needed and the pros and cons of it. So now uh, talking about NFTs, most of us know NFTs stand for non-fungible tokens and there has been uh, neon cats and crypto punks that were sold for like millions of dollars, but not many of us really have an understanding of what uh, a non-fungible token is and how is it relevant. So uh, can you please elaborate more on what an NFT actually is? Sure. Uh, so again, it's a non-fungible token and it is a digital asset essentially that is, lives uh, on the blockchain. You can purchase it and you, you can own it. Uh, an NFT has manifested very popularly right now as art. Um, mm. I, it can manifest as there's music NFTs, there are there's digital fashion, there's um, in-game purchases uh, that like, you know, I don't know if you're playing like a war game, you can purchase a gun and it's yours <laughs> kind of thing. People are ready. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm like, I don't, I, that was probably not the best example. <laughs> you get what I'm saying, right? So um, they're digital assets basically. And um, basically they're unique. Uh, they have like a unique uh, metadata, but a, a unique code essentially attached to them. And that code is recorded on the blockchain. Uh, and it essentially says like, this is yours. Uh, so I own, for example, uh, several different pieces of art and people are like, why can't I just like, I can screenshot that. I'm like, okay, well, you can have a print of the Mona Lisa in your house, but you know, it's not the Mona Lisa. So if you mm. can sort of, you can have a fake Chanel bag, it's still not the real <laughs> Chanel bag. So with that sort of, um, like, if you can wrap your head around that, that's sort of, um, you know, my answer to people who can sort of right click save is the joke in the community um, of these images, right? Um, and and they also like, they can manifest in memberships. A lot of these like art pieces of art that you can buy are these large communities. And there are different um, aspects that people can attach to those communities called like utility. And those are basically like perks or access or, um, you know, different ways of activating the community and driving value for the non-fungible token that you own. So again, like the, depending on um, the value of the non-fungible token, your dollar isn't necessarily, necessarily static too. So your investment in that can grow or go down depending on the value of the non-fungible token that you invest in. Uh, so, so, but 
point blank, it's a digital asset. It's just like, I can buy this water bottle in real life and it's very useful to me. It is a water bottle, (laughs) depending (laughs) um, like an NFT, like eventually it'll manifest in ways I can't even probably imagine right now, but it's like music NFTs, art NFTs, membership Mm -hmm. passes. Uh, Again, uh, that's sort of, we're scratching the surface right now, but point blank, it's a a digital asset that you can own. You've not been able to own a part of the internet before. And and one last thing that I'll say is that um, uh, these NFTs are built on top of cryptocurrencies. So for example, Mm. a cryptocurrency Ethereum is one of the more popular ones. And so the way I like to think of Ethereum is like internet. And then all of these decentralized apps are like built on top, um, sort okay. of like internet. You can have Gmail, you can have, you know, Yahoo, mm. you can have Zoom. Those are all built right. on internet. Um, so NFTs are um, are built on the blockchain, Ethereum mm. or Solana, for example. And um, yeah, that's how you purchase them. So that's that's my take. Oh, that that's really nice. That's. That definitely gives us an understanding of what NFTs is. Just a follow-up question. Uh, you said uh, there's a unique code associated with it. We can purchase it. And it's a piece of uh, internet that we own, right? So if it's unique and if it's something that each of us can create or own, how is the value of a particular NFT determined? And like to purchase an NFT, can I? what type of money should I use to purchase an NFT? Is it like dollars or a particular cryptocurrency on which the NFT is created or can we just interchange? Can you uh, let us know more about how we purchase an NFT and how a value of it is determined? Uh, Phil, do you want to take this one or I can? Uh, yeah, sorry. I was. I, I, I thought you were going to take it. So I was just quickly making some notes. Yeah, for follow I'll up, take so. it. Uh, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we determine the value, you know, um, okay. I own some NFTs that just haven't really taken traction, but I personally really like them, but you know, they just are not, they're not like super valuable. Like they haven't risen in price or anything like that. I own others that I bought for like a couple hundred dollars that are now like right. well beyond that. And I think that it's because those have like a stronger community and following. Mm -hmm. And uh, those in particular are, you know, some of these NFTs that are really rising in popularity right now are becoming just like completely global brands uh, in the Mm -hmm. way that they're building. They're creating these like projects that have like essentially 10,000 pieces. So essentially like, you know, 10,000 owners, let's say, but I I own two, Mm -hmm. so give or take. Uh, but like, you know, they're really like creating all of these sort of, uh, like a lot of utility around these, these NFTs. So there's a lot of growth in that way too. So you start to see these communities that like, either just like, maybe they don't have the rigor in their team to be able to like Mm. continue on with that. Like some are just like overnight successes. Imagine just like owning Nike overnight. Like you have to have some uh, things in place to be able to sustain that. And so I think that we're starting to see these communities that like um, have a good infrastructure in place to be able to sustain that immediate growth or even, uh, you know, some is like a slower growth, but sustain that growth and give back to the community. And then because of that, like the ecosystem at large determines, hey, we consider this valuable. It's kind of like, again, I'll say the Mm -hmm. Chanel purse, like a Chanel can sell a t-shirt that I could buy at Target for like over a thousand dollars because it's Chanel. I like, we as a society have decided that Chanel is luxury, right? So I think people Mm -hmm. determine the value. Um, Just like, you know, we've seen brands kind of hit rock bottom because we've decided that that trend's over and we just like uh, don't want to invest in that anymore. So I think, um, yeah, I think the ecosystem and the community is really determined the value of of something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's super helpful. And uh, just shifting gears a bit. uh, So uh, this is about the example that you shared is an NFT that we create or that we own. Uh, For example, at the Leprechaun, it has been mentioned that gaming and blockchain collide at Leprechaun, right? So, Phil, can you share an example of uh, how a video game player can interact with 
NFTs in a game. And in addition to NFTs, what are other uh, blockchain atoms like uh, tokens or something that the user, a normal person can interact with on a video game? Well, um, the simplest, I'm going to use the World of Warcraft analogy, and I hope that doesn't geek out geek the audience, and I hope it doesn't age out the audience, because obviously World of Warcraft is um, is 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 old. Um, uh, I've not my wife won't let me tell people how many hours I used to play that when I was younger. Anyway, so um, uh, the the uh, it, his World of Warcraft is great because it actually has um, a direct analogy with four primary elements that would make up blockchain. One, in the game, you have an inventory, otherwise known as a wallet. Um, you yeah. have in-game currency in World of Warcraft, if I remember rightly, it's like bronze, silver, and gold, which basically can be done as a token. Um, you have special items that you um, you know, uh, go to great lengths to get. Those sort of turn into NFTs. Um, uh, and then you, there in a couple of the major cities, you can walk into the auction house, which is basically a marketplace. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> there, you know, the the real power in games, and then I'd like to throw in a couple of other examples to, ex to, to extend what Izzy was saying, and also to it answer some of the questions in the chat about where NFTs can go. The repowering games is, for me, the shift from the mm -hmm. publisher-owned economy to the player-owned economy. When you play World of Warcraft, mm -hmm. you own nothing. You may pay your monthly fee um, to play the game, but at a whim, your account can be shut down and you are left with nothing. <clears throat> um, uh, this has happened. There were very many, 10 years ago, there used to be stories in the game press about someone else had their account shut down for some strange violation of some um, uh, uh, weird um, rule on page 97 of the rule book. Um, the shift we want to see is, is to the player-owned economy. That doesn't mean decentralizing games, but it does mean that you, because, because at the end of the day, if you have to say, if you have to click MetaMask every time you kill a monster, it's just not going to be fun. But the, this idea that you are going to steal, steal a line from a certain Vin Diesel movie, you own what you kill. Um, you know, uh, everything, you know, if you, if you get something, it's yours. If you earn something, it's yours. Now, there's a difference between play to earn. One of the things that's happened in the moment is we have the blockchain industry trying to pretend it's the game industry. And we have this whole slew of games called blockchain gaming and terms like play to earn, which are just really token raises. Um, you know, a real game, uh, you know, you should actually, when World of Warcraft first started and the, the first player killed the first monster, there was no money in the game. It was generated, it was mined by playing. So I think we need to have a shift. This has caused issues in among gaming communities who think that NFTs and crypto are a con because of all the blockchain companies trying to uh, do money grabs. You can't really blame them. Mm. Um, you know, so so the the but the under or for I'm, I'm sort of a risk of tangenting here. I apologise. The underlying thing for games is this simple idea that you own what you earn, what what you fought hard for by playing, and it can't take it away from you. If I may, I just want to throw a couple of extensions to uh, 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 some of the things Isabella said um, with regards to NFTs at the moment. A lot of the areas where NFTs are very powerful and art is one of them is this concept of the creator economy. Mm. And, and that essentially means getting rid of the middleman. Now, in decentralized finance, I pointed to those big shiny towers. The middleman is the banks. There are many middlemen in traditional industry. In one example, and a company I was involved with called Clout.Art enables you to turn your NFT, your Instagram posts into an NFT. You have to burn the post first, so it's only NFT. But then that means that instead of a creator having to get sponsorship for their Instagram channel and essentially say things they may not necessarily think because their income is from third parties, this enables creators to interface directly with people who collect or, or by their art form. And by art form, that include everything from music to games to, to uh, videos, whatever. Um, right. So that's one example. Another example of the middleman, um, uh, Isabella, you mentioned music. There are some companies, in fact, there's a, an organization called Token Tracks in London, which has got a lot of big name music producers involved, which is actually just about to launch in two weeks. It's, it's Token. Um, they are a music NFT interplay. Uh, it, it, um, um, uh, marketplace. Um, and this again 
the middle the middle group here are the record companies now the collators the collector that sorry the influencers who are like the DJs etc create playlists the buyers buy the music and the creators are rewarded so cuts out the record companies right. and another area where this is happening um uh is um uh oh what was that what was that? oh yeah so in the metaverse everything in the in, in the metaverse is an nft you know so the companies another thing i'm involved in is, is something to actually bring architects into the metaverse so that buildings and spaces can be properly designed so nfts are more than the jpegs that many people associate with them right now they actually represent the rights of creators to be rewarded for their talent mm -hmm. um you know, and it represents the proof that you own something. An NFT in a wallet could be why, how you get through a door. I see that NFT mm. in your wallet. That means you can come through this door. I see that NFT. That means I know you own this property. Why can't property mm. these be NFTs? So the actual power of an unassailable, immutable, and non-recoverable asset in your wallet, mm. far and wide, far and wide the current JPEG craze, although, you know, some of those JPEGs do represent amazing communities, uh, and some have really taken off. But of course, as soon as the board uh, BAYC, the crypto pills and the uh, and the punks took off, we, you know, how many different types of apes have there been? <laughs> yeah. so, um, so a lot of people, again, you can't get past the old adage, do your own research. There are really good mm -hmm. ideas out there that protect creators that look to cut out the, the layers of fat in the relationship between consumer and producer. Um, but you do have to look uh, carefully to make sure you're, you know, you know, you're not jumping on a bandwagon. I think just to add to that, just as much as it benefits the creator, mm -hmm. it also benefits the collector. I'm a collector. And for me, like, you know, I'm not necessarily able to like walk into these galleries and like afford a piece of art or maybe even be able to even talk to the gallerist who's there because they may not look at me in a way that I should be able to buy that art, et cetera. So it's also a really beautiful thing like for me as a collector to feel like I can really enjoy and be a part of the art world um, and vice versa, mm. just like from the art NFT side of things. I think it's really cool from a collector perspective as well. Like it really opens the doors there. Yeah, yeah, those are really great pointers. And in both of uh, the explanations that Phil and uh, Isi gave here, I think uh, what we could understand from an audience perspective, are there are different types of NFTs and there are different benefits associated with it. You can be a creator or you can be a collector, right? So for an intellectual person who is just starting to look into investing into NFTs, how does one evaluate the right type of an NFT that they want to own? So. We have to do some research, but as you said, there are music NFTs, there are art NFTs, there can be anything on the internet that can be converted into an NFT, especially in the metaverse as well. So how do we evaluate which NFT is right for my investment? And are there any specific marketplaces or wallets that uh, you would recommend us to start diving in deep into before we start making investment decisions? Uh, shall I have a go at that? Okay. I'd like to start off by saying, hashtag, this is not financial advice. There are, um, you know, in NFTs, there are sort of four, uh, I suppose you have to decide which one of the following four personas you fit when you buy an NFT. Um, you know, are you a supporter? You know, are you actually supporting a project because you believe in it? And so you're, 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 you know, you're, you're donating to it, its ability to fund itself. Are you, um, uh, um, are you a, uh, an accumulator? You know, the people who love the thrill acquisition, never underestimate the power of some people who just like collecting things. Um, are you an investor who's looking yeah. to make um, a return either by a, a capital gains on the asset um, actually, you shouldn't say capital gains. I guess the IRS involved um, by making selling the asset for more than you than you bought it for, or or from um, or from um, uh, you know rewards that you get during the lifetime that you own that asset. And then the other mm -hmm. one is what I call the social climbers, the ones that seek NFTs that bestow special status, access, etc. Et you know, NFTs that come with bragging rights. The big example of that, of course, is now BAYC. 
So there are different reasons for buying NFTs. And one um, Izzy touched on, which I think gets pushed down. If you really like something and you are able to buy it, there's no reason why you shouldn't. You know, you mm -hmm. can just enjoy owning something that gives you happiness. It doesn't always have to be about, you know, 10xing your money. Um, uh, uh, you know, um, it can be about supporting a cause. Um, there are, I think there's been several examples of this. Obviously, the most zeitgeisty at the moment is with the situation in Eastern Europe um, and their NFT collections that have um, uh, uh, basically raising money to um, help yeah. fund Ukrainians in the defense of their country. Of, of an example here in Hong Kong, close to home, we had this ridiculous story where there were a couple of suspected cases of transmission um, of yeah. uh, COVID from hamsters to people. And we had what we called the great hamster cull and the government said, please, could you hand your hamsters in? And so someone raised an NFT clear, just <laughs> Google it. it it's just, I, I don't even know how to describe the ridiculousness of it. But anyway, um, you know, but people do, sometimes NFTs can be about the zeitgeist about making a change change and that can be very powerful it is a very effective way in which you can move money from people who like to help to people who need help um but then there are, you know so if you're looking for the most common reason people think of for nfts right now is the profit motive um okay. obviously the big marketplace is open <clears throat> mm. there is a lot of stuff on open <laughs> um so really, if you're going to do that, you need to do your research. Uh, most of the major sort of community slash art projects will have a few things in common. Um, they'll have a website, they'll have some sort of value proposition, and they'll have a Discord server. Um, mm. If you really want to get into the world of sort of, uh, N you know, these 10,000 run NFT collections, you're going to get, you have to get your head around Discord because really that's what the primary, and I hate Discord, um, the primary window on, um, on, uh, 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 onto what, how active a community is and what they're doing. You really have to look at the value proposition. You know, mm -hmm. uh, some NFTs are basically about building games down the line, building, you know, um, at the moment, play to earn is thrown a lot. Some are simply, BAYC has just become a status symbol. And I think it's now in um, self-propelled mode, perpetual motion mode, where it just is. Um, so yeah, and there's there's many. Uh, OpenSea only works for NFTs and Ethereum, which is where if you're going to launch an NFT, mm. launching Ethereum is where you say you're serious, even though the gas prices are high. But Binance Smart Chain um, and Polygon, all which you can all access with the same MetaMask wallet, all um, have marketplaces. Um, uh, and then we've got everything from Zilliqua to Avalanche and all these other blockchains, which would just make this whole conversation even more confusing, um, <laughs> who are launching, and, uh, launch, launching marketplaces. But the end result is they're very easy to find. But again, hashtag, this is not financial advice, but hashtag do your own research. Um, uh, because there are some really interesting ideas out there, some interesting value propositions around communities, utility, belonging, possible profit motive. <laughs> But there's a lot of um, also ran stuff as well, simply trying to jump on the bandwagon and taking advantage of people who 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 um, who are excited by the hype. And 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 that actually we've managed to get to eight th uh, to 40 minutes and we've not mentioned FOMO, um, the fear, <laughs> fear, fear of missing out. You know, that is a very powerful motivator. And everybody in the crypto industry who's trying to sell a token, their primary marketing tactic is FOMO. Everyone should understand that and take everything they see with a grain of salt and do their own research. Can I add to this? Definitely, yeah. Yeah, so in terms of just like, again, not financial advice, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think uh, a couple of other things to add onto this uh, yes, there's, you know, sort of all these different types of communities really like what you're saying around like the social climbers and the rewards, like kind of bucketing it that way. I was writing that down. Um, but yeah, this space can be very overwhelming right now in terms of like doing your own research. Um, you can't, one of the main, again, marketplaces is called OpenSea, OpenSea.io. Uh, when you go on there though, you, you might like be able to see like what's trending and different artists, but it's still a little mm -hmm. overwhelming. Like you're not going to be able to be like, and this is the one I want to join. Right. 
this community is really manifesting big on Twitter. If you haven't been on Twitter in a really long time, like myself before last year, um, you really just have, you don't even have to like tweet, but you need to really start like digging in on like the community sort of under start understanding what people are talking about and just become more involved that way. Um, you'll start right. to kind of see the different projects and artists kind of come up. And again, mm -hmm. like Phil was saying, it gets overwhelming too, because you start seeing tweets like, I just made life changing money. And you're like, oh my God, <laughs> all this stuff. And a lot of people coming into this space are start with like sort of the money mindset, like mm. what money can I make? I think that's pretty much everyone. But once you kind of dig deeper and, and you actually do invest for the first time and you start to see like the power of community and what really these projects and what Web3 is mm. all about, um, you kind of stay for that stuff um, and the money um, kind of becomes maybe like a perk here and there if you need it. I don't know your financial situation, but um, another th thing to look out for are, um, so Bill was talking about these projects that kind of come in and what's called like a rug pull uh, where mm -hmm. uh, you, know, <clears throat> you invest whatever and then they just like take the money and disappear essentially and they just cheated all of these people of their uh, money, right? Um, so some things that are kind of manifesting now are like, don't invest in teams that are not doxed. Doxing um, or like, uh, doxing means like your uh, your real- Your LinkedIn, you can go yeah. to their LinkedIn page. Like my real name, my real face is showing. It's not just like an avatar. Okay, I'm not anonymous anymore, right? And so a lot of these like rug pulls are happening when the teams are fully anonymous. You can't trace them. You don't know these people. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of something that people are saying is like, you know, and I personally also agree with um, another thing that I uh, stick by is like, I don't invest money that mm -hmm. I can't afford to lose. Like yeah. these right. communities might shoot up one day. Ethereum might go down the next day. Like anything can really happen. And the market has been a little volatile over the last, like, since I've been in it <laughs> uh, last year, um, we actually yeah. had like a good run for a while, but even in these past few weeks, it's been a little all over the place with everything happening all over the world. So I think like, you know, again, not financial advice, but like you shouldn't be investing in things that like you aren't willing to also lose kind of like the stock market, the stock, the stock mm. market can crash. And if mm. all of your savings are in there, yikes. <laughs> so that's just, I think you should determine what that is for your own financial, uh, your own financial situation and take that into consideration. Um, and then, yeah, I, uh, I think that's, I do actually want to give one cool example um, that Phil was mentioning around um, supporting a cause, like uh, just how quickly things can, like you wouldn't necessarily be able to do this in the traditional world. So everything happening in Ukraine right now, in 24 mm -hmm. hours, uh, one of my good friends in this space, he, um, he whipped up uh, an effort in 24 hours got 37 artists together and mm -hmm. um, they literally raised um, over a million dollars in primary sales and then a whole lot more afterwards in secondary sales so that's another thing um, when you sell what your car uh, for, for so the pro uh, they're calling it relief and it's going to be a humanitarian aid uh mm program moving forward and their first cause was Ukraine. Um, oh. Yeah, and so uh, they have been working with uh, people in Ukraine to put the money in the right hands and, and help with relief efforts. Uh, but they did that literally over the weekend right. in 24 hours, we're able to do right. that. And that's not really something, that's like a really interesting use case on like right. how charities can like evolve um, using this technology mm -hmm. too. So just a little example. Who remembers, yeah, who remembers the big telethons from not too long ago? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, for the audience, I think a few actionable items that we can look into are uh, from what Phil and uh, Issy said, I consider purchasing an NFT similar to purchasing a stock. So you just have to put in some research on 
which industry or which type of nft that you associate the most with and then start investing in that nft instead of just on the comment side so should i just what is an nft that just looks cool in case of art nft and then wait for it to boom so if you're just interested in art you can go ahead with that but i really uh second uh if and phil's recommendations on identifying what cause you associate yourself most with and then put some research into identifying those nfts associated with that cause and start investing in it and one more resource that both of them pointed out is the open sea and the discord communities associated with each of these uh nft creations and also verifying the credibility of uh the people who create these nfts so that you associate you put a face to the the name on the community that is associated with the nfts so i think those are the two key takeaways from uh what phil and isi said in terms of investing and to your last point of uh, both phil and isi i think you talked about how nfts were uh, used to support the humanitarian cause in ukraine and that was also one of the call outs that was mentioned in the chat so where do you see the future of nfts going and can you help us visualize any real time examples like maybe youtube or spotify and how they might change uh with nfts in them just so that we could visualize how nfts would transform the current web 2 with the web 3 um honestly i think that i can't even imagine the ways in which that this technology will manifest in the future and that's what makes me so excited to even be involved um you know it can range so the other day i was on a twitter space it's kind of like um I don't know if y'all heard of Clubhouse but it's essentially like being oh, on the Clubhouse the audio only. <laughs> yeah, it's it's super fun but I was on with the mayor of Reno and she was talking about how she's kind of um you know connecting with mayors across the country because there are right. these like art funds in all of these cities and she really wants to bring NFTs into that. She was also talking about how she might want to um look into fractionalizing a piece of land essentially like right. letting a lot of people own from this community like from the city that piece of land and each right. person might have like an nft to own mm -hmm. and that like verifies that they own a piece of that land and if a target's built on that then like everyone who owns the land gets a piece of mm -hmm. you know a cut of the pie in terms of like whatever money is made based on you know profits or whatever the deal is so like that's a different way um you know you see like you're going to really start seeing i think people figuring out ways to not only unlock digital perks and mm -hmm. and and things but also in the physical world um i don't know like i think it's just really exciting and um that's why i'm so excited for people to start really people feel like these concepts and these things are very far away but like the way that i came into this space learned and now view the world is very different than the way the mayor of nevada does cuz she's like mm. in government and you can mm. start seeing like a bunch of different use cases like she would see different mm. ones than i would as a marketer or community builder right. than phil would etc so i think mm. like I can't really I, I, one last thing I will say is uh piggybacking off what Phil said earlier is the creator economy and just like to mm. answer your question of like what's like a really tangible way to like see this come to life so for example right. it creators right now on Instagram for example they don't make their money from like all of the hard work and like building their community and like like mm. the like they don't get that money directly they're getting it from like brand partnerships right like right they have to not only create a bunch of content which is really hard and time consuming they also have to like do a ton of brand partnerships to even like make a buck and like be able to live right and so mm. what you're starting to see is um like how uh sort of tokenized communities or monetization of the community that you're working so hard to build and mm -hmm. so um even right now like on Instagram they've already sort of and on Twitter too they've unlocked sort of the tip feature um for creators where you can mm -hmm. sort of like pay the creator that like you're a fan right. of let's say and it might unlock different sort of perks and things like that um that like exactly like if you were like a Taylor Swift fan and you bought a ticket to her concert like you know there's different ways um that 
those perks can manifest. Another way to think of it is like, if you're investing in a creator that like you really believe in, the value of that token would obviously go up. And then also um, like you can verify that you were an early supporter of said creator and you can unlock perks in that way too from the creator standpoint. So I think like that's a tangible way to kind of think about like, uh, how this is affecting us right now is that creator economy. Right. I've got to, I've got to comment on this because I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring uh, that, fa that fantastic example. I'm gonna bring it home. Um, there is, um, there is, uh, uh, with this change from basically a third party dictating what your content yeah. is because you've got to earn the money to basically through blockchain being able to create and people who collect being able to work directly with you. Beyond that, uh, and there are there, there's an example of this would be something on a chain called the Sway Protocol, um, uh, SWA.Y, and that what they're into is creator staking pools. So you hmm. don't just stake a token; you stake a token against a particular creator because you believe in them, hmm. and then as that creator successfully monetizes their talent everybody in that pool basically underwriting that creator earns and mm. this has led to a new concept which is in the blockchain world staking is the new mm. following ah so that was, okay that was that, that i just I, I, that that led to that i thought that would uh, i mean that's really where that's really where it's going everything until now everything we know from banking mm. to to um money that is banking um to to um uh, to, <laughs> to social media etc it's all been routed through the through the middle guy mm. but what is changing in this decentralized world many of the examples of building uh, peer to peer things on on blockchain oh even even um betting now instead of going to a, and this is a very english thing it's going to be a little different in the states instead of going into into a bookies and saying hey uh, uh you know um uh, uh my one year old by the time he's 18 will play football for wales that actually mm. really happened and he won. Um, you know, now you can go to a peer-to-peer, -peer, you create mm. a prediction pool. There's no middleman setting the odds. Again, all these things are at getting rid right. of, of all these layers of fat where most of the profit went and enabling mm. those with good with a good idea to connect with those who want the good idea, supply and demand, and just automate it so it's fair. So, um, I mean, to then circle back to where NFTs could be, and the uh, core NFT is unassailable proof that thing is yours. And then you can, mm. and then you can build an application layer on that, whether it's a key to a door, fractionalized real estate. That's a fantastic example. There's a few organizations doing that. There's so, there's so many opportunities. Really comes down to the blockchain that says this wallet address for which mm. only you have the private key owns this asset. Right. And no one and nothing can change that fact. Mm. Yeah, definitely. That's that's really interesting insights. And I think we have taken most of our session talking about NFTs. So without maybe going into digital currencies, we could just la take the last few minutes to go over any questions from the chat, specifically about NFTs, since we have dived in deep into NFTs area. So uh, I would start looking at the chat and uh, start uh, going over any of the questions that's happening here. And I think we had also received one request when many people reaching out with this, with this request when we started putting this session. So how do you transition from a career perspective into Web3? So if you could just share some examples, either from Leprechaun or Meta on what uh, the company is looking for a candidate if it is trans transitioning to a Web3 company and where does one get started and what roles are still relevant in the Web3 industry? Um, I'll have a so, so in other in other words, uh, for people who don't yet work in some area of this sort of crypto umbrella, how do they move yeah. their careers into that into the industry? Um, well, I can approach that many, many ways, but you know um, companies that do this, are companies like anybody else. Um, so you know they have all the different positions from marketing to HR. Um, to, you know, um, product management, project management, and then, you know, uh, uh, financial management, you know, executive leadership, 
all the bait, you know, their, their companies, sorry, if you hear my dog barking, I apologize, Esky, stop it. Um, uh, uh, all, all these are companies like other companies. And so all the different primary disciplines are, 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 are available. Um, so, you know, and LinkedIn actually for this industry is pretty good place to start because most people yeah. um, do post their stuff to, to, to LinkedIn. Um, so you can start looking for companies, following companies, and just follow the chains and build up, set up your job seeking profile on LinkedIn, et cetera, you know, and start demonstrating an interest in crypto would be a, a good idea. Um, obviously, with crypto, there does tend to be this focus on the tech stuff. Um, right. uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and it's particularly in crypto, which has always been very product led. I honestly yeah. don't think if it was marketing led that the experience of MetaMask would be as it is now. Yeah, that was definitely a product person thinking that, you know, um, but it is, you know, that people do focus on that. But actually, a big call as a marketer, I think, is you agree with me, we need more marketers in crypto because yeah. the product people aren't very good at it. <laughs> um, so... So, you know, and we need to start building solutions around, as Steve Jobs said, um, you know, it, you, you don't come up with a great technology and productize it. You find a customer pain point and you bend the technology yeah. to solve it. And this is a phase that crypto is going through at the moment, because until now it was very much product led and not, and not uh, customer experience led. Um, yeah. That's starting to change. So there are many, many opportunities. The easiest, the first thing I do is jump on LinkedIn and start looking up all those companies. We're very easy to find. All the crypto companies are very easy to find. Just, just go through a list of all the, the token tags in, in, in CoinGecko or CoinMarketCap and start following all those companies. Follow them on Twitter and you'll soon see how to get into the community. Yeah, I think another way too is um, once you start joining different communities, for example, there is a community that I'm a part of that's called Boys Club Crypto, and it's a women, for women and non-binary people, and um, everyone should check it out. They're really great. Um, so people go in, like they introduce themselves, and you start seeing like all these people working in like all these like really cool companies that like LinkedIn's a great um option but there's a lot of these like sort of scrappier startups if that's something that you're interested in that again also need all of the same roles that are in web two um in web three so um i think a lot of you are uh product marketers here agree with phil we need way more marketers i think that's one of the biggest one of the 911 things we need in web three and in crypto is like we need to be telling the story a whole lot better because there's a lot of skepticism mm. um but there's bad actors literally everywhere so we need to like mm. flip the script a little bit um but yeah i think uh a lot of people think that they just like aren't ready or can't participate because they just don't know mm. enough but the cool thing about this space is that like nobody knows everything everything's very new and a lot of people are making it up as they go um and that's beautiful right I think that as long as you know some of the basics um definitely have an interest in cryptocurrency like there are things that you can learn to like get up to speed but I think the value you add is like sort of your own personal perspective applied to whatever it is that you're working on um and you have to just have curiosity around this technology and you need to be able to, I think also just thrive a little bit in ambiguity because things are literally mm. changing daily um, mm. with this technology and within this space. And so I think there is a little to a degree of like rolling with the punches depending on which sort of part of the industry you want to land in. I mean, there's like more traditional companies. There are these uh, organizations called decentralized autonomous organizations, which mm -hmm. is more of like um, like a more organized group project that you want to be a part of, <laughs> and they all kind of do different things. So you can participate in several of those, and there are ways to make money there. These sort of uh, NFT projects, I know they need a lot of help because, again, they may not have the infrastructure or rigor coming mm -hmm. from like. Um, you know, more corporate world. So there's value added there. So there's a lot of different ways. LinkedIn right. is a great opportunity to look for those. Once you start tapping into any communities you'd like to be a part of, there's 
you know, you can always ask around and there's people, you know, posting job opportunities. Mm -hmm. And then also just like plugging into Twitter and sort of seeing the different groups and organizations and startups that are popping up because there are so many. I like, I'm trying to start keeping a list because it's just overwhelming, but it's just so interesting to me, like all Mm -hmm. of the different ideas that are kind of popping up and the different things people are working on. Right, right. Definitely, really agree. And uh, I understand we are on time, but there is just one common question that is uh, across the chat, which is, is there any resource or one place where we could get, get started to understand the fundamentals? Do you have any uh, recommendations or newsletters, uh, resources that we could start looking into to build our fundamentals up? I've got one. I mean, it's I, I'm not sure if it's 101. Um, but there's a, there's a newsletter and a, a sort of Discord group called Bankless, um, which 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 I really like. Um, it take you know um, uh, it also uh, Google is your friend. You know um, there's a lot of really good sort of 101 stuff out there. So basically, you could like type into Google Crypto 101 um, and see what comes up. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, it's uh, I'm trying to think how I learned, and I haven't got the faintest idea. Um, and in fact, interestingly yeah. enough, I watched uh, 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 my wife, who worked for a bank until very recently, was not allowed to go near crypto. And then she left right. and she was like, going, right, give me that phone. Um, and, then so, and, basically, and, and she said, she, she said to me, how does anyone learn this? I, I, I actually understand money. Right. This is really, really difficult. I think you just have right. to the, the start off that I would start off with an account with a reputable CEX. I'm not going to do any ads um, and start looking at the tokens that are trending and then look at those tokens, look at the company pages, you know, Honestly, right. people who are successful in crypto are the ones who don't have someone say, can you can you just tell me what I need to know? You know, this is where actually successful people take responsibility for their own knowledge. And, you know, there are people who spend days researching a token before buying it for a long term yield hold. Those are the people who make money, not the people who look mm. for shortcuts or or can you just help me? You need Google the hell out of stuff. The, there's a lot of information there, communities, positive yeah. and negative reviews, every bit of knowledge. Uh, knowledge is the empowering factor here and the thing that makes you successful. Yeah, for me, I, uh, it was really, it took me a while, like not going to lie, like Bill was saying about his wife, like I read it and read it and read it. And I was like, what the hell is this, this article saying to me? Um, but I really just had to wrap myself, like my mind around sort of like the, um, like the technology. Cause I just didn't under, I'm like, what do you mean blockchain, like crypto, like what gas fees, what does this all mean? And so I actually put some links in the chat. One is to this, uh, the one that I just Googled and found is called block geeks. And they have these mm-hmm. guides on there that are like, crypto 101 what is definance 101 and it literally breaks it down for you like really like kindergarten level which is what I personally needed I was I couldn't keep hearing all these technical (laughs) words I was like what are people saying um and then I also put um there's this woman named Gabby Goldberg um she's also on Twitter she has this web three reading list and Mm -hmm. there's she just like consolidated just like a bunch a bunch of articles that are in here um and Mm -hmm. you can kind of take a look through and it kind of starts again it's like I think you kind of have to uh, you know start just wrapping your head like little by little around like what is the technology why do Mm -hmm. people care about it and then you kind of start thinking about like oh these are potential use cases Mm -hmm. oh you know xyz and you kind of like slowly but surely like don't get overwhelmed in needing to know everything. Mm. You're just not going to know everything. I think that's one of the best unlearnings that I've had is like, you're just like not going to know everything and you need to be okay with Mm. that. Because again, things are changing every single day. So just actually just be excited about that and don't get anxious about Mm. that because it it is exciting. Like there are new things happening every single day and just take things in stride, read it, learn it. Okay. On to the next. And you just have to kind of accept that like right now, this space is like very, very early and very ambiguous Mm. and there really isn't like one sort of centralized place where all of this information lives even Mm. if you asked me for help 
there is no way that I could share with you all of the knowledge. Cause like Phil said, That's it's true. like, you must do the legwork right now. There's not like mm. a one size fits all in, uh, and how to approach this space. Cause like what's interesting right. to me may like literally not be interesting to you. So mm -hmm. it just, um, my journey is not going to be the same as yours, but I can share some of these resources. And then you really do have to um, do some of your own legwork to, to get up to speed and, and what's happening and what the concepts are. And hopefully like I, for me, this space has really reinvigorated me to feel like curious and creative um again and in a way that i haven't felt in a really long time and so hopefully you know your participation makes you feel something similar these are definitely great insights and resources and i think for the audience i've noted all these links references and insights i've shared and uh, we are recording the session as well and we'll be sending out the email with this recording and any resources they have shared uh, and yes, with the disclaimer that this is not a financial advice, this is just a suggestion that they have recommended to us to go over and build the basics. <laughs> so yeah, I think we are over time. Thank you so much, Phil and Isi, for taking the extra minutes to share the resources and insights with us. This was a really, really great session. And for me, at least, it was like giving me an overview of what the basics are, how I should like build my investment strategy and how I should do my groundwork before I even start to dive in deep into this area. So really great insights and we would definitely love to follow up with you on any of the questions or insights. Uh, to the audience, please follow them on LinkedIn or Twitter, wherever they are active and we can just keep an eye out on the insights that they share in other platforms as well. Thanks guys. It was awesome. It was a lot of fun. Very nice to meet you both. Thank you so much. I've learned so much from you, Phil. Um, <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. I'm going to come find you. I'll come find you guys on LinkedIn. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Trinity. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Have a great Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.